math, and I love math, and so it started there. And then through this process, he actually asked me, you know, so why did you leave it? What are you doing now? And I said, you know, that, I said, I actually was in ministry, full-time ministry, if you will, and we're all in ministry, but in full-time ministry, and then I went back to the classroom for a few years. I said, the one thing that I realized was, you know, while I still love math, and I always will, and I love teaching students, what I realized really quickly was that it was very difficult. My mind and heart couldn't fully get back engaged with something that felt very much more temporary. And so, anyway, that led him to ask, well, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm actually a pastor. And so, right away, without me saying anything else, he starts spilling what he believes about God and this and that. And so, we ended up with... A lot longer dialogue than what we expected, um, but and who knows where that conversation will go. I left him my name and phone number uh, and told him, you know, if you ever have questions, come back and you know talk with me. I know that he's headed off to college here soon, but the doors are there. And what I take away from that again is there was nothing eloquent, and Emily can attest to this. There was nothing eloquent about my speaking. It really came down to there was a connection point there. And that connection point actually was math. And so when you engage people, hear their stories, listen to them a little bit, because we all know if you listen long enough, you'll find a connection. We're all interconnected just simply because of our humanity. But oftentimes that can be the door with which we can be able to in, 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 uh, experience dialogue that can and let them lead that into the place where they are receptive. So, with that, let's turn to the book of Isaiah. And I'm gonna, I don't have this in my notes, but I'm just going to quickly ask who here has ever received coal as a gift for Christmas? Anybody ever received coal? I received a little ornament that was a bag of coal one time years ago, but obviously, we all know that this is not something that we're going to buy for our loved ones if we want to have another Christmas with them. So, uh, but my sermon today is, well, when is coal a good gift? So we're going to please turn with me, and it will be on the screen to Isaiah chapter 6, starting from verse 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two covering his face, and two covering his feet, and with the other two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who is called, or who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken with his tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Brothers and sisters, what is it that is the most important thing in your life? Now, for some people, they may answer that that is found, that, that their happiness, their satisfaction is found by what their bank account says. Others may look at it and say, well, I'm well-liked. I have been blessed with good looks. Others may say, it's my family. That's the most important thing in my life. But I want to bring us back to and point to something 
about who truly is and what truly is the most important item in our lives, and that is God. There's only one subject that would come or should come first and foremost in our identity and who we talk about, and that is God. Now, I want you to know that in interactions and even through some of my time in seminary, one of the things that was emphasized was about the importance of understanding who God is and who God is not. And that oftentimes, maybe we are not as well versed in what Scripture says about God, and we maybe are more well versed in what other people say about who God is, and we become this disjointed, uh, jumbled up mix of who God really is. And so I'm going to stand before you and say that if your view of who God is is wrong, then your view of who you are will also inevitably be wrong. That if your view of who God is is wrong, then your view of what success in this life is will also be wrong. If your view of who God is is wrong, your view of money will also be wrong. And then if your view of who, what God is is wrong, then it really, in essence, everything in your view will be tainted in a wrong way. And so my sermon in a sentence this week is this, that your view of God largely determines your relationship with God. Now, I remember reading a book in seminary several years ago, and it was distinctly to this question about what does it mean for you in terms of your relationship based on how you view God. And I'm not going to hit all four quadrants. I'm going to hit two of them today. And one of them is, or one, the, the, the dividing line is, is God personal or is he impersonal? Let me put it this way to you. Did God create the world and then take his hands off it and say, let, you know, the ball has, has been started, now let's just sit back, eat my popcorn, and enjoy the ride. Or is God constantly involved in our lives and engaged, and is he playing an active role today? The first one that I described there, we refer to as deism. That God is in control, God is God put it into motion, but that's it. He doesn't really care about you. The second one is much more in tune and aligned with what Scripture says, that God is at work every moment. But I've seen that where, if this, where those pe people who have this deistic idea, well, they believe, yeah, they believe that God created them, but they don't believe, they, they can't possibly believe in Jesus because God set it in motion and what will be, will be. That God doesn't interact and intervene. So that does drastically impact their relationship with God. Now a theophany, that may be a new word, but a theophany is a word that means when God makes himself known. And so as we dig into this vision this morning and what it gives us insight into who God is, I'm praying that this stirs in your heart and that it stretches you to a place where you experience the very presence of God this morning. So there's a number of characteristics with which we interact with God here today in this text. And it's first with his immortality. And so the first thing is that when we recognize that God is immortal, it humbles us. Now Isaiah here in chapter 6 gives us a high definition view of God. We might call it a, a 4D view of God. And the first thing that we see very simply in this is God is alive and well. King Uzziah died, but God is still alive. Before the mountains were, ever, were brought forth or ever, you, you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. In Psalm chapter 90, God has been, God will always be, he is outside of time, he is not subject to the principles of this world, he is immortal. God was alive when the universe came into existence, he was alive when Socrates drank 
Prison, or poison, excuse me. He was alive when William the Conqueror defeated the English forces in 1066. He was alive when William B. Travis wrote Victory or Death, this famous letter from the Alamo. And he was alive when Time Magazine proclaimed God is dead in 1966. We read in verse 1 again, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. There is no one on this earth who is a head of state that will be here in a hundred years. The turnover in the leadership in this, country, in this world is a hundred percent. In fact, if any of us are alive, there will be very few of us that are alive, even by the year 2100. But not God. He never, he never had a beginning, and therefore nothing depends upon his existence. He always has been, and he always will be alive. And I want to add one more thing to this, because uh, it's been a few weeks ago now, but we, have, we had uh, some... Some individuals who like to walk around town and hand out, distribute uh, some paperwork at the doorway. And uh, I'll just say, they, they love the door-to-door -door technique, but they don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that Jesus is God. And I want to say, not only here, but in other passages too, it's very clear that he says, Whom shall God, whom shall I send? This is in verse 8. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? God is not talking of one, one independent. Yes, it's three in one. That's the complexity of the Trinity. But Jesus and the Spirit are part of this. And so we need to understand that all of them, I don't know how, much, how many of you have come across this teaching, but Jesus was not a created being. I've heard individuals say that. Jesus is from the beginning. He is not below God. They have dif differing roles, but they are all equally God. Secondly, God's authority strengthens me. So his immortality humbles me. His authority should strengthen us. We read, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now I've read over the years, either through the Bible or other, you know, other, um, other visions that have been reflective of God, and never once have I heard of, sorry Ralph, I've never once heard of a vision of God plowing a field. Or him cutting his grass, or cleaning his car, or filling out reports, or loading up his truck. He's always seated on his throne. So even as we talked a few minutes ago about how the world seems to be coming apart, heaven is not coming apart at the seams. God is never at wit's end. He's sitting on his throne. Everything is at peace in heaven, and everything is under his authority. Now, in verse 1 of the text this morning, there are two kings. There's a dead king, Uzziah, and there's the living king, God. There is a mortal king and an immortal king. There are human beings, and there is our divine king. Now, each one of us sits here with our own sets of troubles. We have our frustrations, we have our apprehensions, and our anxieties. Maybe what it is that we're thinking about what it is that's going to happen tomorrow, or maybe we have a meeting coming you know, next week, or we think about maybe school's going to be starting here in a few weeks, and the anxieties and apprehensions that that brings for adults and for the kids. But you need to remember, even as we look all around us, even as I mentioned what Ed shared about what's going on in Afghanistan, God is still on his throne today. We experience, we've seen a lot of violence even in this land over the last couple of years in particular. It's not new, but it's seen a lot. You may go to the doctor this week and find out that you have cancer 
or some other illness. You need some kind of a new organ. Maybe your spouse may come to you after 30 years of marriage and say, I no longer love you, our marriage is over. Your boss may come to you and tell you, you're fired, or I don't need your position, your position has been cut, whatever that may be. But through it all, whatever the context is, whether you're in it right now or, or it's coming, God is still on the throne. He doesn't abandon us when things happen that maybe don't quite fit what we think should happen. We need, it's, it is vital that we have an understanding of who God is. He is in authority over all. He isn't just an authority over the things as we want them to be. He's in authority over all. And by understanding that, that can strengthen us through these times of trials, or these, even these times of loss that we sometimes experience. Next, God's holiness overwhelms me. Now the next thing we see in here was the conversation about the seraphim. They each had six wings, two covering the face, two covering the feet, and two to fly. Now I've seen some people attempt to try to draw what this might look like, and it's it's really interesting to kind of get an artist's best rendition based off of, of what they read through Scripture. But interestingly, what are these seraphim saying? They are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now when you see the word of holy in the Bible, you can think of something that's withheld from ordinary use. So, it's set apart. You've heard me use that example, set apart, for God. That is what it means to be holy. Now, years ago, my brother-in-law was a college baseball player. And not, he was, I think it was Division three, so he was not one of your going to be in the Major League Baseball kind of players. But he was one of the best players on his team. And I remember one day... Uh, sitting down, it would have been still when I was in high school, and they showed up and met with my family um, when I was in high school at a restaurant for my birthday meal. And what he brought for me was a baseball that he had signed, that he had hit as a home run during his college experience. Now, while I'm not attempting to compare a baseball to what God's calling us, is what I'm telling you is that I, that baseball didn't go home with me and then go into the backyard and get tossed up and be hit around the yard. I set that ball apart because there was extra meaning there. It was set apart for the purpose that the meaning was the connection. It was an, an another layer to the relationship that was growing. He wasn't my brother-in-law at the time. You know, a relationship that was continuing to grow there. So we set things apart. I set that ball apart. You probably have certain things at your house they say, well, I'm not going to use this. You know, maybe it's your fine, it's your fine dishes. Now, I'm going to use this, but not on an everyday basis. I'm going to use this for special occasions. And so in that way, we are called to be set apart away from the things of this world. Now, the Bible uses the word holy to describe God more than any word in the Old Testament. Did you know that? More than any word. In fact, the word holy is used to describe God more than all other descriptions combined. No other description of God is repeated three times in unison like we see here. The, God, the, the Bible doesn't say God is power, 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 or God is love, love, love. It doesn't say he's smart, smart, smart. It just says... He is holy, holy, holy. And when we repeat, we repeat things like this in our society too, but not maybe as often as the Hebrews did. When there's repetition, maybe you've asked yourself, why does the writer say something and then repeat himself and then maybe repeat himself again? Why doesn't he just say it once, cut some of this extra words down? We get the point. It's because in repetition they're driving home the importance of what's being said. For example, if you were 
wanting to explain or express gold, the concept of gold, something that we find of value in this world, that people find value. If you were going to write about this in Hebrew, you might say, gold, gold, or gold, gold, gold. To me, it sounds silly to us because we don't talk that way, but we're emphasizing this is gold, gold. We're not just talking about gold here, but this is gold, gold. You understand there's a distinction there, as weird as it sounds. So when he's saying, holy, 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 he's telling us that God is superlative. He's, he isn't just superlative, he's super superlative. He is beyond explanation. And in their Hebrew way of thinking, when something's repeated three times, it's like saying, it's saying the greatest thing that you could say. You're trying to emphasize, this is, I can't say this in any greater way. There's one main reason that we come to worship God. And there's a lot of secondary reasons, but the one reason that we primarily are called to worship is because he is holy. He is set apart. He is perfect. And so it overwhelms me. It is why I find myself sometimes in worship overwhelmed, flooded with emotions. I couldn't sing the last song this morning, not because it was anything against the song, but I was just overwhelmed with God speaking to me just with what he had for me to hear. I, was, I wasn't in tears this morning, but that's not that uncommon for me in that context. Fourth, God's glory astonishes me. And so we read, even though Isaiah told us that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. It's important here that the Lord himself is not described. The length of God's train is described, but God is concealed by smoke. We know this because in John chapter 1, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at, God, at the Father's side, he has, sorry, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. And God said in Exodus chapter 33, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Now, maybe you've heard the words, I, mean, I know you've heard the words God's glory and the word holiness, God's holiness. So what do those things mean? What is the distinction there? So I'm going to try to explain that today. And maybe the best way to say this is that when we say God is glorious or God is, God is someone to be gloried or glorified, that's basically a way of saying that God's holiness has gone out to the public, has been on display. We see God's glory through something in front of us. But God's holiness is what's internal. His glory is like an open advertisement for his holiness. And then if you think about like a sock, his holiness would be like the inside that's concealed. We don't see God's holiness, but it's displayed through his glory. We also see God's glory revealed in his created beings, in this case, through the seraphim. Now, as I've already said, we don't really know exactly what they look like. We have some words that we can give us a basic idea, but I've seen some pretty unique drawings of them in an attempt to try to, to, to get a sense of what they look like. But we do know that they are six-winged creatures with feet and eyes and intelligence. And they never again appear in the Bible under that label, under the name seraphim. But in verse 4, when one of them speaks, it is clearly not the voice of just a normal individual. It says the whole temple was shaken when they talked. The foundations as well. Now, human words cannot encapsulate this. And so, again, when I use examples, understand, I'm trying to give us something that we can maybe resonate with. Now, years ago, Emily and I were, I believe, in Illinois. We were headed home, and we made a stop for the night at a hotel. And unbeknownst to us, um, as, we're fly or as we're driving in to, to arrive at the hotel, we see some planes flying overhead. And we don't give it too much thought, other than that it was not your normal run-of-the-mill plane that was departing. It, wasn't a, it was not a commercial airline. 
So we arrived, and what we were told when we arrived was, this was a precursor to the Blue Angels show. Now, I've seen the Blue Angels fly over stadiums on TV, I've heard about it, but I've never witnessed it. And it was incredible to watch, and the volume of the noise, and, I mean, just things were shaking, in a sense. And you could see, even though this was something created by man, this was something different. This is not something you see every day. And so they were able to change directions in, in ways that I wouldn't even dare try to do. They were incredibly loud in the noises that you hear, even from the distances that they travel from. And I want you to know that this, the point kind of of this is to help you understand that there are no puny or silly creatures that come out of heaven. God didn't create these seraphim, these, also these angels, to be just minor details. They have incredible power. And so they were made, in a sense, like a blue angel flying a plane versus your traditional aircraft. There's a power there that's different. Again, the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of the seraphim. And we see God's glory in the Trinity, as I alluded to earlier. I said, whom shall I send, God said. And he says, who will go for us? Isaiah is so close to God. And maybe, you've never, I mean, maybe you've never thought about this before. He gets a chance to kind of eavesdrop in on this conversation that's happening between the members of the Trinity. It's really, it's really impactful for us to identify that in the New Testament, they also identify it as us at the end of verse 8 with Jesus and the Spirit. In John chapter 12, it says Isaiah. So this is, Matt, this is Jesus quoting he said, Isaiah said things because he saw his glory, God's glory, and spoke of him. And in Acts 28, and disagreeing among themselves, the disciples, the apostles, they departed after Paul and made one statement. This is the statement Paul made. He said, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to yourself, your father's through Isaiah the prophet. And so we know that God's glory astonishes us. There are things that we can't even begin to fathom what God can do. Fifth, God's essence reveals me. What, what's really remarkable here in this story of Isaiah is how he, in a sense, was brought to finding himself. Now take note of the words found in verse 5. He said, Woe is me! For I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And again in verse 7, note how personal his words are. It says, he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Now, if you go off to search for yourself, to find yourself somewhere, you're going to always end up at a dead end. We may say, you know what, I, I'm going to step away, I'm going to walk away from God, I'm going to walk away from the church, I'm going to walk away from my spouse, whatever, because I need to find myself. And the reality is that in every case, those are going to end, lead you to dead ends. The only way you can truly find yourself is to find God. Whenever real revival and a, an awakening happens, there's what I like to call the boomerang effect. Now, what's the boomerang effect? And my, my dad went to Australia when he was in high school, so I got to, years later, throw one of his boomerangs. And so if you have the opportunity to actually throw one that's of good quality, you throw it, and the intent is you throw it, but then it comes back to you rather than it being like a frisbee. And so what you intend to go out is really going to come back in and help you realize the effect. So again, in Isaiah 5, I read one more time. It's, he's, that, uh, in, excuse me, in Isaiah 5, the chapter before, 
We read that the words that he that God condemns the rich. He says, Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field until there is no more room, and you are made to dwell in the midst of the land. So Isaiah condemns the rich people. Then he condemns the drunkards. He says, Woe to you who rise early in the morning that you may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. So he says, you know, woe to you who spend all of your life being focused on alcohol. And then in, later on in the chapter, he also adds to those, to the drunkards, he says, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. But Isaiah doesn't stop there. He, then he goes on and he blasts all people that are liars. He says, woe to those who draw iniquity with the cords of falsehood who draw sin as with cart ropes. And he does, he's still not done. He goes even further and he denounces those who are arrogant. He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness in place of light and exchange light for darkness, who put bitter in for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise Sorry, I lost my spot because of that. Do you want to check that and see if that's plugged in? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, uh, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. But as chapter 5 now turns, so he, here he is in chapter 5, giving all of these uh, attention statements to other people. He's saying to you, watch out what you're doing here with your life. But now we transition into verse 6, and this is where the boomerang effect comes in. He now has transitioned into, wait, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He's personalizing it. He's understanding that the message that he sent out, that God gave him for the other people, was equally necessary for himself. He was internalizing and realizing this, I am in the same boat as they are. We are all people of unclean lips. If you want to know if you've seen the real God, or when you see the real God, he will show you who you really are. Most of us see ourselves as part of the solution to the world's problems. And we can be in some way. But it isn't often until God shows us that we understand that we also play a part of the problem, too. The prophet here, Isaiah, has been brought down from his high horse. He doesn't have it perfect. Yes, he's hearing, he's hearing from God directly. He could have been saying, well, look at me, look how great I am. But he doesn't. God brings him back and calls him back to task. No, you are a man of unclean lips. Whenever the prophet saw God through the window, that window was like a mirror. And that's the way it should be for us as well. Not only did Isaiah see God in all of his holiness, he also saw himself in all of his sinfulness. Again, when you see who God really is, you'll see who you really are. You'll never see your, for yourself or who you really are until you see who God really is. And Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, in verse 5. Now many of your translations here, if you read them, may quote the person, the people is saying, I am ruined. Now I want to say there are three people sitting here, and I'm three people in a sense standing here this morning. First, there's the people, there's the person that you think you are. Secondly, there's the person you hope you are. And then the third is the person that God knows who you are. And remember that the more that we know about who God is, the less that we think of ourselves. What began as a window, a doorway to see, in fact, that's how it was viewed in the, in the 
in the old days, it was they got a window to God's message. It was as though God was opening a window. This was a, a common belief that it was like God was opening a window and letting you hear his message. That was a very common mindset amongst the people. But no, this window there is really in supposed, supposed to turn into a mirror. What began as this window was transformed so that Isaiah could see his life as well. Do you know what happens in every spiritual awakening? Do you know the truth behind every revival? It's when people recognize their sin, they turn back to him, they repent. It's when we see ourselves who we really are, who God really is. And finally, God's presence motivates me. Maybe you've heard it said many times that, you know what, they, they'll say, well, I'll do this as long as my mom's not in the room. You know, or I would do this because my, if my dad's not in the room. And then they may think of this, well, you know, God's around us, so that's my motivation because God is everywhere. God knows everything that I'm doing. God's presence should motivate us that God is at work. There's a lot of things in this life that could kind of want to dampen our spirits and maybe say, you know what, that, that, that Satan's trying to get us to, you know what, I'm just going to give up. What, what impact can I really have? Of what value am I in what I see? And God is saying, no. We see that all of a sudden, God became a love, or was a loving God right before our eyes in this text. God's love is a holy love. And when you see God as Isaiah did, you can't help but do what Isaiah did. And so let's read one more time those well-known words from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. We read the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. The problem today is that we have received an inoculation against revival and awakening in many cases. The problem of our day is that we have received a vaccine against revival and awakening. Most of us would say, oh, there he is. Send him. He's got more ability. He's got training. He's, he's in it for this. That's his calling, not mine. During a time of awakening, I imagine, I think of John Edwards, I imagine he probably didn't hear as much of, you know what? Nah, not me. Send the pastor. No, no, not me. Send this missionary over here. Send anybody but me. Send I don't care anybody. I don't want to go. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to these people. I'm just comfortable with my life as it is. No, real revival looks like here am I. Send me. The real God motivates the real me. See, God has offered to each one of us here that live coal from his altar. He took the initiative to love you and to cleanse you. And today that coal that we see is seen through the cross of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you know, the gift that we can never we can never repay, we can never do anything to, to get, Lord. And that is the gift that you have given us of eternity with you through, through faith. Lord, we are, without you, a people of unclean lips. Lord, we are so thankful that you have offered us your Son as a sacrifice so that we may one day stand before you and that you may say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we thank you for examples like Isaiah, an individual who's understanding your call in their life. Lord, they recognize their inadequacy, but they also, he also recognized your desire for his availability. 
He was unwilling to pass along responsibilities to someone else when it was, in fact, him that you were calling. Lord, as we think about what it means to be a disciple maker or a missionary in our context, Lord, you have called each one of us to be sent. So help us as we consider your call, as we pray through what it is that you are calling us to, Lord. Help our minds to be prepared with just a simple prayer that, God, if you want us to do something different, to be something different, to go somewhere different, to be, uh, to be different in how we respond to people, Lord, show us clearly, and we individually and we corporately as a body will follow through. Lord, just make that abundantly clear to us, we pray in your name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and the closing song. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you now and forevermore. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Remember, church, just like Isaiah, you are sent.